Hello everybody and welcome to Alpha Phoenix. You see, I thought that it was going to be hilarious to do the cold open to this video right after spending a couple hours in a row shuffling cards and counting patterns and doing spreadsheet data entry. But instead of looking entertainingly dazed, I just sort of sounded kind of depressing. So while you're watching Filming Brian right now, you're listening to me editing Brian. And while the experiment itself was really tedious, the results were really interesting. So I hope you enjoy the video. Hello everybody. Today I have been nerd sniped into talking about probabilities. A couple months ago I watched a Matt Parker video where he showed that two consecutive perfect shuffles from a new deck of cards could actually result in a perfect bridge deal where you start with all four suits separated in a deck but by perfectly interleaving them twice you could get a shuffled deck where every fourth card was the same suit. So if you dealt them out to four players, everyone would get the entirety of one suit, ace through king. Matt correctly points out that this arrangement, this perfect bridge deal, is significantly more likely to occur if you start with a new deck of cards and do two perfect shuffles, rather than actually randomly arranging 52 cards into an order where they can be dealt out into a perfect hand. That said, now I'm wondering, how likely is it that you, by random luck, execute a perfect shuffle? Granted that you don't know how and you're not trying. On a surprisingly related note, uh, this is my random number machine. You may remember it from another video that I put out a couple years ago, and this actually uses quantum mechanics to generate true random numbers. Basically, there's a circuit inside that counts, if we turn it down, you can see how slow it's going, it counts from zero to nine over and over and over and over again. And it halts that count whenever it detects a particle has passed through this Geiger tube in the back. Every time that this Geiger tube detects a tick, that means that some high energy particle has passed through it. About half of the time, that's gonna be some cosmic ray particle like a muon coming down from the sky. And about the other half of the time, that's going to be some radioactive particle coming out of the Earth's crust. Say, a uranium atom decayed somewhere below me right now. That might be what's making this thing tick. Effectively, the number displayed on this Nixie tube is the time between ticks on this Geiger counter divided by the time it takes to go from number to number as this Nixie tube is just cycling, plus the previous number that was displayed on the Nixie tube, modulo 10. <laughs> Don't worry, there's not gonna be a quiz. But because the first item in that equation is time change between ticks on a Geiger counter, that is something that is physically unpredictable, which means that the output of this machine is random. I will say, freely admit that this box is not perfect. The output is very, very slightly correlated. I've never actually bothered to check the normal distribution of numbers coming out of it, uh, but regardless, it is random. So shuffling cards is another system that is designed to produce unpredictable output. But because this is sort of a more idealized version, we're going to shelve the card game for a minute and talk Geiger counters. I swear it'll all make sense. With the original electronics that lived inside of this random number generator, I think that what I was actually doing was just slowly increasing the voltage on the Geiger tube, and at some point it would arc, and that would be the tick that I heard, and then it would fall down, and then it would slowly charge up again. And this is decidedly not random behavior, because it takes approximately the same amount of time to charge up the tube to an arcing voltage every time that it ticks. When I rebuilt the machine and made a video about it, I wanted to know that the ticks on the Geiger tube were actual particle detection events and that they were actually randomly distributed so that, you know, I wasn't fooling myself again into thinking that I'd built a random number generator when I hadn't. And the cool thing is that we can do this with statistics. You might not think that random numbers should obey statistics. They're random. If you get a single random number, you can't say anything about it. It's unpredictable. But if you have a large number of random numbers, 
you have a lot of random numbers, you can actually with pretty great certainty say what the behavior of that collective of random numbers will be if you combine them and average them all together in sort of a clever way. Let's say we have an idealized signal emitting pulses at random times, but on average about a pulse every five seconds. You may intuitively say that it's unlikely for you to go 30 seconds without receiving a pulse in this setup. And this intuition is correct. And without any math, we can just test this by brute force simulation. So if we open up MATLAB, we can make a list of random times. Let's say that there are all the times that the Geiger counter detected a pulse. If we generate 1000 times that occur at random intervals between zero and 5000 seconds, then on average, there's five seconds between each Geiger pulse. Here we can see there was a pulse at 2.6 seconds, a pulse at 5.7 seconds, a pulse at 23.1 seconds, and so on. But of course, the time between any two adjacent pulses may vary. I mean, if we take this whole list and subtract it from its shifted self, we can get a list of time intervals between adjacent pulses, and obviously these aren't all the same. This is basically a list of wait times. You're asking, after the Geiger counter detects a pulse, how long do you have to wait until another pulse is detected? If we take a histogram of this list, we find that most of the wait times are extremely short, less than, you know, three seconds here. Although the average time between pulses is still five seconds. It's extremely unlikely that there will ever be a gap of, say, a minute between pulses. In our 5,000 second sample here, the longest gap between pulses that showed up was about 38 seconds, which is actually surprisingly long. Like I said before, the more random numbers you use, the easier they are to predict. So with a thousand clicks here, you may already be able to see the shape this graph is making. It looks kinda like exponential decay. But just to be sure, let's crunch the y-axis down into a log scale, and yep, now, it's a really beautiful straight line. This is definitely exponential decay. So this is all rather abstract. What does a histogram of random numbers pulled out of a MATLAB program have anything to do with this random number machine and generating random numbers and eventually, you know, shuffling cards? I haven't forgotten about it. Like I said before, when I was testing this machine, I wanted to know that it was actually random. And to test that, I set a microphone next to it and just listened to the ticks off the Geiger counter because that was actually the easiest way to collect a lot of data. When you look at this waveform, there's these obvious clicks that are presumably particle detection events in the Geiger counter. And if we measure the gaps between each of these clicks, take a histogram and plot it on a log scale, we get, drum roll please, exponential decay. Albeit with a little bit of a glitch up front. I did not actually wire the Geiger tube properly, apparently, because there's a pretty long delay where once the tube detects one event, it doesn't want to detect another event right away. Something about the impedance of the high voltage power supply that I used and the capacitor that I used to smooth things out and stuff, but I didn't bother fixing it. But aside from that, it's making the right curve. The tail of this distribution looks exactly like exponential decay. And if simulation matches the reality, then I can say with fair certainty that this machine is actually producing random ticks and it's using those random ticks to produce random numbers. So now when I show you this graph, and I tell you that I made this graph by counting runs in shuffled decks of cards, you might be intrigued. Clearly something random is going on to make this plot. I mean, shuffling cards is supposed to randomize them, so it's a good thing. In order to get a perfect shuffle or pharaoh shuffle, you need to get a run of perfectly interleaved cards that's 52 cards long. If you wanna know how likely getting a pharaoh shuffle by accident is, you could just sit around all day and shuffle cards and check every time. And you know, once you had perfectly Pharaoh shuffled maybe four or five times, you could take the number of times that you successfully Pharaoh shuffled, divide it by the total number of times that you attempted to get a Pharaoh shuffle, and then you'd get your statistics. But that would take forever. So I decided not to do that. I don't know if anyone has ever done analysis like this on shuffling cards before. I guess I assume that they have. But 
my gut reaction when I saw Matt's video to say, man, how likely is it to get a Pharaoh Shuffle was to just count runs of cards that are shorter than 52 and extrapolate how difficult it would be to get a Pharaoh Shuffle without ever actually performing a Pharaoh Shuffle. Just say, well, yeah, you know, to get a run of three cards in a row or five cards in a row, it's, you know, X difficult. And if you want to get 20 cards in a row, it's harder. So how difficult is 52? I also was kind of hoping that they would be randomly distributed in the same way that ticks off a Geiger tube are. And as it turns out, they are. To test this, I took a new deck of cards and split it in half, so I was always shuffling with 26 cards in each hand. Then I'd shuffle the cards together, turn them sideways, and count runs of perfectly interleaved cards. For example, this shuffled deck contains runs of 1, 3, 1, 3, 1, 7, 2, 2, and 1 interleaved cards. And then you have to do it again, and again, and again, because random numbers only get easy to predict when you have a lot of them. At this point, I should mention that I'm doing this by hand and not just simulating it on a computer, because I honestly have no idea what the ideal shuffle is or should be. As you shuffle a deck of cards, if you go longer and longer without cards coming from one hand, you're actually still moving your fingers. So a card from this hand is actually becoming more and more likely the longer that a card doesn't come from this hand. It's weird that all of the probabilities of, you know, which card falls next are modifying each other and have history, and nothing's really obviously supposed to be normally randomly distributed. So I just did it for real, like a good experimentalist. I actually think that anybody doing this would get a slightly different result than me because we all shuffle cards slightly differently. In fact, the average number of cards that participate in these 111 interleaved sections increased measurably over my first 20 or 30 shuffles, and the average length of these 111 interleaved runs increased over the time that I was trying to collect this data. So I think I actually got better at shuffling while I was doing this experiment. It didn't matter that much though, because as I added more and more data, a gorgeous straight line appeared on my semi-log plot, indicating that the distribution of interleaved runs was perfectly randomly distributed, just like the wait times between Geiger ticks. I honestly was not expecting it to come out that cleanly. It's really nice and linear. Now, in order to calculate the likelihood of executing a perfect Faro shuffle by accident, all we need to do is extrapolate by lifting this plot up until we get a single run of 52 interleaved cards. And by that method, you'd need about 900,000 shuffles to produce a single perfect shuffle. But that's not actually an unattainable number. I mean, if you think about the number of times that a deck of cards might be shuffled, I mean, every time that you shuffle a deck of cards, you actually shuffle it a bunch of times. And if you think of all the people in the world that might shuffle cards on a daily basis, this is absolutely going to happen. Also, the people that shuffle cards a lot probably have a much smaller expected number here. Because like I said, I got better at shuffling cards over these hundred shuffles that I shuffled and measured and counted and logged. And if I only include the last 35 shuffles of my 107 shuffles, presumably once I was warmed up and my average length of interleaved runs was higher, the math says I would need almost an order of magnitude fewer shuffles to statistically reach a perfectly interleaved run 52 cards along. So these numbers are very fragile. But I would say at a rough order of magnitude, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of shuffles to accidentally get a Faro shuffle. But do we trust this number? What's this number actually telling us? It's saying that runs of 52 cards in a row are likely. It doesn't say anything about the fact that the deck only contains 52 cards. This method is actually most valid for an extremely thick deck of cards where you're just shuffling and shuffling and shuffling and shuffling, and somewhere within that massive stack, you end up with a run of 52. That's all that this math is telling us for sure. Edge effects make it significantly messier. I had actually anticipated this probability curving down, sort of sub-exponential decay. That, I don't know, was that a thing? As I got to higher lengths of runs, I assumed that I would frequently interrupt long runs with the edge of the deck, 
like if I had a run of 10 that was right on the top, is that actually part of a longer run, like a 12 or a 14 maybe, that extends out the top of the stack? I mean, by this logic, you'd have to reach a run of 52 and get that run to start exactly on the top of the deck. Naively, I'd say that this just adds another factor of 52, and then you'd need to include the chance of runs longer than 52 that extend outside the deck, but in any case, that's not what I saw. The reality of shuffling cards does have an edge effect, but most of the long runs that I saw were actually in the center, and for some reason, the way that I shuffle cards, the cards at the top and bottom of the stack tended to clump up a little bit and go down as doubles or triples or worse. So I'd say that for me, it's almost impossible to get a Pharaoh shuffle accidentally because the edge effects when I shuffle cards almost completely prohibit me from getting a long run that starts at the very top of the deck or continues through to the very bottom of the deck. So where does that leave us? Well, I'm probably not going to be executing a perfect shuffle by mistake anytime soon, but it's a lot more achievable in general than I thought based on the math. I also have unexpectedly direct evidence that practicing shuffling actually makes you more likely to get a Pharaoh shuffle. It seems like it's obvious, but you know, now there's data. I love instances where the same math can be used to describe completely disparate physical systems. Like, the inverse square law that shows up everywhere, or Ohm's law, which can be used to approximate a lot more things than just resistors in circuits. But even really obscure examples, like shuffling cards for a card game and ticks from radioactive decay on a Geiger counter, very frequently end up linked by some underlying thread of similar physics or mathematics. It's awesome. Thanks for watching.